Hey everybody, Super Strider here, and I have a special guest this time. Um, a man who has his own series and a bit of notoriety, but I listen to his stuff all the time because he's a really cool dude. Uh, care to introduce yourself? Well, hi, my name's Hardy Fisher. I'm the publisher behind Bone Yard Press, the most controversial publisher of comic books alive in the world today, and also the owner of American Horrors, the world's best uncut horror channel that's a free to watch around the world all day, all night. And also, I'm the host and uh, owner of the radio show Heart Attack, my co-host. Uh, Which I will be posting links in my description of this video. So the guy, the sheer, the small amount of people who follow me who don't listen to Heart Attack, you better start listening. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a tough show. Heart Attack's a tough show. I understand it's not for everybody. Yeah, I, my language is quite ribald. I'm cursing like a sailor. <laughs> I get angry. I scream. I yell. And I'm the furthest thing from PC, and I avoid all the trappings and all the easy buzzwords of conspiracy theory and crap like that. Yeah. I just talk about the facts and politics of what's happening now in front of us. Yeah, pretty much. And I don't care much for PC myself, considering the fact that I have a mental, I have a mental disability. <laughs> and I don't care about peace, political correctness. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter to control speech when they start making me correct to say, but you're now controlling speech and you're destroying the First Amendment. Yeah, that's pretty much. But we should be focusing on our topic at hand, and this is actually a recording, so I have this information for the paper I gotta write for a class I have to do, and I actually chose American Horrors as the uh, company I wanted to write about, at least for this paper, which is, uh, I have to develop a strategic plan following the text material, so even when it's all said and done, I still have to follow what it says in the book. But I'm using American Horrors as the subject because I can get a lot of information from you about it. And then just right. w work it in with the uh, what the textbook wants. And I have to basically just satisfy what my professor wants. So, And I'm also, if I can get it written, and if I can get it written before it's due, I want to send you a copy so that you can proofread it and tell me if there's anything you want changed. Okay, so we're going to first start asking about questions around American Horrors. What exactly is American Horrors? Well, American Horrors is meant to be a horror company that services the needs of horror fans. And we started with the Horror Channel. We originally started developing the concept of American Horrors around the television program for Europe. Hence, the words American Horrors. I wanted to create something that was easily searchable on Google. And I wanted to have very common search terms so that my titles would show up right away. And we have struggled to uh, implement this word out there and to create the brand of American Horror. Because to me, American Horror is meant to be all things horror. We have started with the TV show, and we went from the TV show to the television channel, which has been on the air for over two years now. And we are also gearing up with our distribution wing and starting up with our apparel, and we're looking into getting our digital publishing going. Okay. Uh, one thing that you mentioned in your show is Heart Attack, and I already know most of the answers to these questions. It's just for the sake of the recording. But uh, you mentioned Film On, which is the platform that you started American Horrors on. Care to elaborate with it, what it is and what's relevance to American Horrors? Well, the great thing about the age that we live in right now, if this was 1994, I wouldn't be able to launch an online television channel in any serious shape or form. But with the progress of technology, you can now have a digital cable company like Film On. Film On is the first true 21st century cable company. And you can take the word cable out of it because what Film On does is they do everything that Time Warner does or Comcast or perhaps Direct TV or Dish Network, only the pipeline that they get the water to you in is different. They're using Wi-Fi. They're using Internet. So instead of having to call up a cable company and drill a hole in your wall to add the cable into your television set, we're already set up to go over the air and, and over the Internet wires. And so I felt that Film On was a really good place to launch a horror network. You didn't have to deal with a lot of the same FCC licensing fees. You don't have to deal with the same uh, 
broadcast standards and guidelines because we both know that horror is a thing that can be a lot of things to a lot of people. So we want to avoid censorship. We want to avoid government oversight. We want to be able to do what we know horror fans want us to do. And we want to be able to act quickly. Now, Film On is owned by billionaire Alki David. Alki David is the heir to the Coca-Cola bottling empire in Europe. And Film On is a European company. So the new age is worldwide. And Film On is directed towards that new audience. When I talk to people over the age of 30, they don't understand internet TV. But if I talk to everybody under 30, they already have, like, two people over 30, a television is a television. But to everybody under 30, that's just the big monitor in the living room. You know what I mean? Yeah, pretty much. I'm under 30, but I still review, I still view a regular television as a regular TV. Because that's all I have in my house. <laughs> I do too, but I also now just see it as a monitor. Once you start working with flat screen televisions in post production, and you're editing on flat screen monitors on your computer system, and now you just go to a bigger giant television monitor in your front room, it's a monitor now. It's not quite the same anymore. And as this, this nomenclature changes and becomes more acceptable, you're going to find cable is going to disappear. This is all going to go either over the web or over satellite. And I don't think we're going to see as much like, quote, cable companies. Cable companies are going to disappear and become what Film On is, which is a multi-digital company. And they're distributing on a much more easily accessible platform. If I want to watch FearNet, I'm going to have to go get a cable deal or a satellite deal. And even then, it's just I'm going to get commercials and broadcast and they're going to be edited for content. But with Film On, I'm now available to the entire world. The entire world has access to my content. And they can watch it on their cell phones for no extra money. And they can watch it on their iPads for no extra money. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's actually a really cool thing. It's one of the reasons why I actually tried to move away from YouTube in the first place when I moved to Blip. Some of my videos were blocked in certain countries because of its content. Even though it falls under fair use. Very, very political. YouTube has become very, very political. As we go into other world markets and we go into other areas, what is taboo in America is not taboo in Spain. And what's taboo to an Indian audience over in the Asian community is going to be different than what's offensive to us. So it's very important for me to avoid censorship with horror because horror plays with archetypes, horror plays with fears in your head, and that can lead to a lot of censorship because people, some people don't like to be touched there in their head. They don't want to have a horror film get to them, and it deals with, with sometimes unseemly subject matter and things that make you uncomfortable, and Alki at Film On has been fantastic in backing us up and allowing us to be who we need to be and that is the modern audience. I don't, I, I'm, I'm, big, I'm, I'm a big fan of freedom. I, I don't advocate censorship. To me, censorship is showing weakness. When you have to censor an idea, you're saying, I'm too weak to withstand that idea. I am too weak to withstand that word. When you say, you're not allowed to use the word cunt, you're telling me, I am too weak to withstand a word, a vibration. And my fear and my problem is so great, I'm going to censor your mouth. I'm going to tell you what you can say based on how I feel. And LT is fantastic in that he backs us to the wall and allows American horrors to be what it needs to be. If I want to say, fuck Fangoria, I can. If I want to say, fuck Rue Morgue, I can. But if I was on regular broadcast, I might have some issues. I might have some problems. I would have issues with the language. You know, it would, it would change everything. And that's one of the great things about the Internet and Internet business is we're currently in a wild, wild west stage, and they're trying to settle and tame the wild, wild west. It's part of why I'm so politically active on Heart Attack, because companies like AT&T and media conglomerates want to lock up the web. They want to lock it up, and they want to put it under its own domination so that they can continue to give you, oh, the horrible service you get from Time Warner, the horrible service you get from Comcast. Yeah, Comcast is the only area or internet provider around here that I know of. Maybe Verizon provides some coverage here. 
And uh, then there's WOW Internet, which I have never heard of before, but it only exists here in Hammond. <laughs> and I live near Chicago, so... Gotcha. Oh, so let's get back to American Horrors. We've already covered the main focus, because you kind of covered that in the first in the first question. What do you hope to accomplish with American Horrors, if we haven't covered that yet? <laughs> well, it's very simple. I am here to own horror. I'm here to be the biggest generator of horror content. That is my goal. I wish to own, dominate, and protect the horror industry in a way that nobody has ever done before. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Its products have major shelf life. You can reboot horror franchises a lot easier than you can reboot, say, an action franchise or especially a comedy franchise. If you sit down and you go to Box Office Mojo and you research the box office for horror versus action versus comedy, you're going to see that horror kicks the shit out of comedy, especially overseas, because a guy coming out of the bushes with a machete and a mask on is scary in any culture. It doesn't need to know, oh, well, what's funny about that? You know, it doesn't need those cultural references. Fear is fear. And then you can get into the cultural references, and then you can have your Japanese horror that deals with their mythology and their demonology. So American horrors is meant to be horror for everybody. We're meant to make horror products for the Goosebumps kids, for the kids in high school, for the slasher film fans, for the Twilight fans. I believe that those products all deserve to exist, and they all have their audience. And so American Horror really wants to service the needs of the horror consumer in a way that nobody has ever done before, because we are horror fans. We know what they want, and we're one of them. We're living our dream at American Horrors, and we want to share that dark, bloody nightmare with the rest of the world. <laughs> I think you covered my next question with that. I was about to ask what your ne- for the next one was what's your target audience. Well, I think you already covered that. <laughs> so well, uh, my target audience is very simply horror fans. Growing up, they used to say that oh, girls don't like horror. Well, guess what, folks? They found out that there's only a one percent difference between the audiences. Women have become one of the largest viewerships of horror, hence Twilight, hence all of the horror shows on the CW. Now, granted, I'm not a fan of, I don't know, uh, Vampire, Vampires Are Us or Arrow or whatever, you know, the Carrie TV show. They're, they're kind of soap operas for kids. Now, I don't hate that. It's just something that I don't need to eat the same way I don't need to go to McDonald's and eat a burger. You know, I want to eat something a little bit better than that. Maybe I'm going to go get a Wendy's. But it's still, those are all choices that should be there for people, and we want to be helping them make better horror. We want to help directors and creators make better horror. We want to advance the field and the idea of what is horror. We want to do so much with horror because that's what I want to be working on for pretty much most of the rest of my life. This is something I'm really into and want to be doing for the next two or three decades. Uh, I'm a, a long-term horror fan. It's really helped me out in my life. And so I'm, I'm bringing that insight into the products that I want to bring to market and the artists I want to foster and help help them grow and create the next wave of filmmakers, the next wave of horror authors. Where is the next Stephen King coming from? Steve's getting old. He's going to die soon. We need to find the next guy. We need to find the next John Carpenter. We need to find the next Toby, Toby Hooper. And that's part of my mission. Speaking of Stephen King, my mom's actually met him once. When, back, when we were li- back when she was living in Maine, I think it was right before I was born, she ran into him at, a, like, a, I think it was it's some type of restaurant. I forget. I got to ask her again. But she was too paranoid to ask for his autograph or whatnot. But, yeah, that's a kind of cool story that my mom has. Uh, you, you, I'm like, I know for American Horrors, and you've discussed this on Heart Attack a lot, you have a lot of competition. What exactly is it? Well, the competition is mostly from the corporate point of view. There's a channel called Chiller, which is owned by Universal. And that, that's horror for nobody. It really is. It's a horror channel for nobody. Nobody's really watching that channel. They're just dumping their content that they already have in their library. The stuff that they can't sell anywhere else or make any more money. They really don't have any respect for their audience. They don't have any respect for their consumer. And I don't believe they understand their consumer. 
And then you've got FearNet. And FearNet, again, is a corporate-based horror channel. It's, it's what a corporation thinks a horror fan is. And we're talking about Sony. So this is a foreign corporation and what a foreign corporation thinks the American horror fan is. So what you get with FearNet, I don't know, it's just a TV channel. American horrors is a mission statement. It, it's not... It's not a style of life, it's a way of living your life. It's, it's, horror fans are different than your normal fan. They're, they're collectors of the Freddy Krueger dolls, and they get all their, their different versions of Evil Dead. Horror fans are a little unique and a little different than your average action fan or a comedy fan. They're a very, very interesting audience, and they, they come from all gamuts and all walks of life. So I feel that these other horror channels I don't believe they really respect their audiences. Out of all of my competition, I think FearNet is the best. There's some other channels that are on Film On. There's a channel called Chillings. There's a channel called uh, FearNet has one. They're not FearNet. Uh, Film On has its own horror channel. But frankly, we outpace all of them in ratings because we're better. You know, we care. We try to find horror films that we want to see. And when you go to FearNet, that's some corporate lackey figuring out what they think may be a horror fan life because they like gore, don't they? What's the new thing this month? Whereas at American Horrors, we're putting up what we want to see and what we think other horror, we're like, you know how it is with a horror fan. You're like, oh man, have you seen The Human Centipede? Oh, dude, I'll loan you the DVD. You've got to see this movie. And that's how we are. American Horrors is the revolution in horror. We're here to bring horror back to the people, to the people that really love it, to go to the conventions. I've been a First Amendment advocate throughout most of my career, and I have bled for the First Amendment. I have been on the front lines fighting for horror, and I'm going to continue that work with American Horrors. I'm going to push the boundaries of what people think horror can be. And that's, that's just part of it. I mean, every day there's a new wrinkle, or there's a new creator, or there's a new short and there's a new music video, and that's that's the joy of running American Horrors. Now I'm starting to ramble, aren't I? <laughs> that's all right. I don't plan on cutting any of this out anyway, so <laughs> it takes too much. It's too much of an effort to do so. <laughs> Which is why you, this get this is not going to be edited <laughs> because I want to spend time doing other things I need to take care of for school and stuff like that. But you actually reminded me of uh, my way of thinking when it comes to modern video games because I'm a gamer. And uh, how I how how, how I have a ma- yeah how I have a major disdain for uh, GameStop because they only push one type of thing that's like shooters and stuff like that because everyone plays that and I play the more obscure stuff and particularly particularly with my PS3 I import Japanese games because they have some good games that are available out there and that's one of the things I do it's just that I prefer the more obscure stuff that's actually really good and. I'm like with these ty- types of good games. I'm like, oh man, you gotta try this. This is awesome. But well, as for me, I work on a computer all day. I don't have the same amount of free time for gaming that a lot of other folks do. So I'm kind of simplistic when I come to a game. I'll come to a game, and I'm the guy that wants Bullet Storm. I'm the guy that will only play God of War because I don't have a lot of time. I don't want to sit and get locked in a puzzle room for 15 hours because I don't have 15 hours to blow. Honestly, I need it kind of simple for me as a consumer because I just don't have a lot of time to get too wrapped up in the game. So a lot of my gameplay is, is very simplistic just for time time management, and I'm tired when I'm playing the game. My mind is worn out. It, it's a way to check out, and that's what horror is. Horror is a way to check out, and, and I think horror shares a lot with gaming. The Soska sisters said this. They brought this up in their, in their Q&A for American Mary, which you can see on American Horrors, by the way. Uh, they talked about the gaming aspect of making films. Most people in corporate don't understand. They want to explain everything away right away. So as soon as you get in, you're like, here's what the movie's about. Here's the characters are all about. Here's the name. And here's all the... And it's like, shut up and let me watch the movie. Quit telling me about the movie and let me watch it. And so they don't understand replay value. And that's something that filmmakers got to really figure out. Because movies aren't about... It's not a ziplock. You don't just watch it once. Movies became become a part of your your own personal mythology. Movies are the modern mythology, the way we tell our legends. It used to 
used to be in writing and books, but now that it's gone visual and you've got movie screens, these are our modern mythos. And so people get very personal with their films, and they'll watch them over and over again. So you're going to want to have shit in there that you don't catch until the third viewing. You're going to want to have things in there. That's one of the things I hate about the modern horror films, the twing, 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 twing sound tweeting on everything. A guy's peeling carrots and then he takes his teeth out of his pocket they over sweeten the soundtrack too much they point everything out so if something flips by in the background you got an enormous stinger you know and it's like let the scares build a little bit more you dummy sounds a lot like uh, the differences between the two of my favorite survival horror series Resident Evil and Silent Hill Resident Evil is basically built on jump scares and loud stinging noises while Silent Hill, which the first one is actually one of my best, my favorites for the PlayStation, is designed to actually mess with you. And it's more subtle when it comes to the type of horror. Because it tries to get in your head. It's one of the reasons my, my brother will not play it, because he doesn't like the fact that his head's getting messed with. And I find it enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're... I, I, I gotta admit, I think horror gaming is an amazing place for horror to go. And I think that the game, the gaming industry is something that, it's something that I've been looking at pretty hard and it's some place I want to go with American Horrors. I still own all my characters from Boneyard Press and so I'm interested in developing them as video games and I want to develop some more horror games with American Horrors. That's definitely something we want to do. We want to get involved in doing horror apps. But right now I'm a pretty small operation. I, I don't have a lot of manpower. So I'm forced to really focus on the network, the channel. And the reason I'm so focused on a channel instead of like making a feature film is because I needed that nonstop stream. You make a movie, you're going to spend a year, maybe two years going to war to make that movie, and it's a battle. And then when the movie's finished, you've got another war. You've got to get it distributed and get it out. So that could take you years where nothing happens. But when you own the television channel, bang, you're up, you're running, it's, it's immediate. You don't have to wait anymore. And a big reason why I did American Horrors is I was getting screwed on distribution. It's, it's known in the industry, it's right. It's right for fraud and for stealing from the filmmaker. It's, it's a big, big deal. And that's a part of why I wanted to create American Horrors is so I could have a home where artists could go and release their film including myself, and actually deal with human beings and actually get real sales reports and actually get their share of the profits. You know what I mean? It's yeah. crazy. The film industry is rife with fraud. <laughs> and actually, I'm going to school for video game design, funnily enough. And that's well, what my... I want to be. I want to be doing video games with American Horrors and especially my comic characters. Yeah, we'll get to. We're, we're going off track, and we're already running behind. So, uh, uh, okay, back okay. to the uh, I, back to the questions about competition. How do you deal with the competition that you that you do run into? Well, honestly, I don't feel like I have any real competition. The only competition I think I have is Fairnet, because if you look at the other channels, the quality of their work is piss poor. Their editing is piss poor. The Sure, they're all going for the cheesy oogie boogie. Look, well, I've got my boobs hanging out. And I'm, I got a silly cop hat on, and I'm on a cheap set. And we want to compete with Fearnet right where they live. We want the quality of our our shows to be as good or better than their shows. And I feel our shows are. Unlike the other horror channel, we have our own in-house generated television programming, like True Crimes. True Crimes is a TV show we have with Burl Barr and Don Waldman examining true crime, but not the body of the weak garbage that's on CNN, to really get into the causes of crime, to really get into the repercussions of violence, to really talk about the effects on victims' families. Those are the kinds of things we get into. The American Horror Television Show is the, the best news magazine run-around horror show that I've ever seen. It was my When we made it, it was a dream show. Because there wasn't a show like it on the end. There still isn't a show like it on the end. There isn't a show that runs around that. There's been some that kind of tried to duplicate it, and we picked them up and, and actually aired them on American Horrors. So we have a lot of really good original programming, and I feel like what's coming out of my competition is the same old regurgitation. 
holy crap, it's not original, it's another version of Elvira, it's another version of Vampira. It's the same thing regurgitated over and over again, whereas in American Horrors, we're creating this stuff to entertain ourselves. So I don't really feel that I have actual competition, I just feel they've got more money to spend than me. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I don't watch most TV nowadays, because, well, a lot of it's just, I, most of it's just garbage. When you have, like, the History Channel, when you have the History Channel doing Ancient Aliens, which, for some reason, my mom loves that show, and yet I'm perplexed as to why it's on there. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't have... I don't really believe all of it, but I find the interest in the history interesting, and I like the uh, way it goes into mythology, and I especially am interested in the Indian mythology, not American Indian, but, you know, Asian Indian mythology over in India. I, I, all their stuff in, in the Bakali and Shiva and Baba Ganoush, all their mythology is very interesting to me. So I like that part of ancient aliens. I don't really buy a lot of it. I don't really buy a lot of the alien stuff, but I'll tell you something. Uh, aliens visiting Earth from the sky in ships makes a lot more sense to me than a bearded dude in a robe creating the Earth. Come on. I keep in mind, I mean, uh, for my, uh, my actual religious beliefs, I'm Catholic, but I'm also not gullible. <laughs> so, sacred for John. <laughs> it's not going to bother me that much, or at, or let alone at all. <laughs> uh, back to the uh, interview. Has American Horrors expanded in any way? Oh hell yeah! We were we originally were thinking about we've been me and my wife have been talking about American Horrors and going over what it should be and how we could started for years and years and then in 2008 I got a contract with the global broadcast company for doing a horror block for Europe for a bunch of new satellite shows and once I signed that deal that's when it became real that's when it became something really real and I knew I wanted a channel but I just didn't tell anybody because I already saw other people crash and burn horribly I saw Fangoria just burn through money trying to... They were involved in launch of a, a thing that we're trying to launch called the Horror Channel. And I was so excited for that, it, it never happened. And then Lionsgate said it was going to do something, and it never happened. And then when Chiller finally happened, I was like, what the hell? This is terrible. Freddy's nightmares. No, I had nightmares about that horrible show in the 80s. How can it get a... You know, they just put on the biggest garbage that they had on the air. The only thing that Chiller had that was really cool was the original Twilight Zone episode, and I also liked the 80s Twilight Zone episode. But so that was the channel, and then I heard about Fearnet, I'm like, ah, I'm not worried, these guys don't rock, they don't have Danzig, they don't have Danzig on their channel. None of these channels will do Satanic Sunday. No, they don't understand the horror consumer. They barely understand them. They're going by what they think they might maybe might know about horror, whereas me, horror has been a lifetime obsession. And it has been for my wife, too. She's Japanese, she's from Japan, and she's an integral part of American horrors. And I think that's a big advantage we have right there is the sum of the experience of my wife and, and myself. I've been flown around the world to give lectures on team building and leadership. I don't think the head guy at Fearnet has had that experience. I don't think the head guy at Fearnet has worked hard to put a killer in jail. I don't think the head guy at Fearnet has fought for the First Amendment and had protest marches on his home. They're not real. They're just another suit who's occupying that job until they get fired and they put the next suit in his position. American horrors. <laughs> We're the revolution, baby. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, if you guys haven't figured out yet, you should probably watch this series or this channel. I, I keep, I can't where it's good. It's <laughs> free, you know, that's the thing. Fearnet, you got to pay money to watch Fearnet, okay? you got to pay your cable fees. And what happens if your cable company in your area doesn't carry it? Then you're screwed. But American Horrors, get on the web, get on your phone, get on your iPad, get on your Android. Boom, we're there, and we're free, and we're on all day, all night. There isn't any paid programming. There's no, I don't know, thigh thinner thing at, at 5.30 in the morning on American Horrors. We're all 
are all the time. Okay, uh, back to the questions. Uh, what are your plans for future expansion? Well, we're doing the channel. The channel's getting bigger all the time. We're getting ready to launch our second real season of new programming. All last year, we did a lot of great new stuff with Count Crazy Craig as one of our horror show hosts. And Count Crazy Craig. <laughs> I remember Count those. Crazy Craig. I actually remember those promos from uh, from uh, Heart Attack and the other show that you're in. And I try those not to swear. <laughs> I don't those like. Are fun. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be doing more more on the set visits. We're talking to more people around the world about doing convention coverage for us. We're actually talking to some people in Ireland about it. We're talking to some, we already got people in Chicago involved in this kind of thing. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm talking to a lot of talent around the country, and we're picking up a lot of original web series. We already have a zombie series, 813, is running. We have the world's best horror review show, Fright Asylum from the web has come to American Horrors. We also have the American Horrors intermission is getting ready to premiere. And that's a serious interview show. It's going to be an hour. And we also have the second season of True Crimes. We have original horror shorts. And I'm putting the financing together to start doing original, like original fictional horror on American Horrors. There's a couple series that I'm in the process of finding financing for to do original fiction. You know what I mean? Instead of it just being interview shows, we're going to do our own, you know, real shows. And that's something I'm looking into. And plus, we're also looking to get more involved in publishing. I'm going to be publishing American Horror's first book, which is going to be a little bit of a biography on me called uh, An American Horror Story, which is my horror story involving uh, the 10 years it took me to put a murderer in jail. And so it's all about the real-life violence behind Boneyard Press. We're working on doing a digital library. We were in negotiations with a couple companies to start doing digital publishing and digital libraries. And we're also in negotiations to start our own DVD line, our own video on demand line. That's actually really cool. <laughs> I'm gonna have yeah, to check out the. Right. I'm gonna have to check out those DVDs if it, if it comes out because, well, I don't have internet at home, so. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Though I can, though if it, though since it's free, I can at least do it at the school on its lousy Wi-Fi connection. But uh, the last major question for American Horrors is: anything else we viewers should know? about American Horrors. Well, right now, one of the funny things about, it's February, as you interview me, and they talk on and on, oh, women in horror, oh, women in horror, oh, women in horror. Hey, motherfuckers, this is the only horror company co-owned by a woman. <laughs> That's actually kind of awesome. <laughs> it's the only horror, American Horrors is the only horror channel where a woman is doing the programming. Is there anybody in fear that doing the schedule that's a, a woman that decides what shows go on at what time, on what day? And I'm not saying, like, oh, she has to ask me. No. No. This is a grown woman. This is a serious woman who knows her shit. She decides what she's going to air on Tuesday. She decides what she's going to put on Wednesday. She decides what's going on Thursday. You get me? Yeah. Now, nobody else in Hover can make that statement. We're the only one, because I really... I think women are fantastic. I think there's so much talk and there's all this feminism stuff going around. And you know what, ladies? There's a lot of gentlemen out there like myself who actually really respect you, really respect the value of the work that you do, also respect the value of your own perspective. Because women in horror is far different than men in horror. When you look at the creators, when women make horror, it's very different than when dudes make horror. It's, it's a different perspective, and I love it. I, I love that women are getting involved in horror, and that's actually one of the, the big excitements of, of horror right now is how much women are getting involved and are truly involved in Hollywood. Uh, women have really taken over. There's so many female directors and writers and producers and executives. I mean, hell, I don't think there's one male TV executive at ABC. All the shots are being called by women at ABC. It's my understanding. <laughs> and you, you see, you mentioned your wife, and uh, from I know because uh, you have talked about it multiple times on American Heart, or well, not American Hearts, uh, on the uh, Heart Attack as well as a uh, WTF. That she actually, uh, like a few years ago, she was had a major battle with cancer and managed to pull through. Yeah, uh, we had a real issue. 
she had a very uh, difficult time with ovarian and cervical cancer and nearly killed her back in 2006 and 2007. My mom actually had a my mom actually had a like a, a tumor on one of her ovaries uh, back when I was in high school and had to have that removed and she was it basically bedridden for months. Yeah, this took her out for for like almost two years. It really destroyed her. She was very she was very lucky to be alive, and part of that is because of Japanese healthcare. Thank you, which is socialized medicine. Thank you to all you assholes out there that want to talk shit on government supplied medicine. Well, in Japan, they got it right, and my wife is alive today. Whereas my father died from his prescription drug use here in America that was given to him by his doctors. So here in America, my dad's doctors killed him, but over in Japan, they saved my wife when the doctors here in America didn't think she'd make it. Which brings up another point that I always keep, uh, re- or I always discuss. When it comes to the, le- when I'm discussing with, like, friends and family about the legality of medical marijuana and stuff like that, I don't, I don't do it, I don't take it, but at the same time, I easily see the benefits and I believe it should be legalized. Well, hell, let's, let's talk about some benefits real quick. Uh, my father had rheumatoid arthritis. Marijuana would have helped him quite a bit, actually. If he'd been able to get edible marijuana, he wouldn't have had to take the pain pills that killed him. <laughs> Gee whiz. Gosh. And then there's the issue of anxiety. Marijuana is an amazing, amazing cure for anxiety. It has chemical keys in it that mimic the body's own natural anxiety relief keys. They're the same, the same thing. Then there's the issue of hemp, whereas it takes much less resources to grow hemp for paper, to grow hemp for clothing. All of it is cheaper, easier, faster than trees. But for some reason in this country, we're still doing it all with trees instead of hemp. Mm -hmm. Paper lobby? Mm -hmm. Cotton lobby? Because money talks in this country. Yeah, that's a major problem. (laughs) Yeah, medical marijuana, it's not even medical. And they've actually said, I mean, when you've got the president saying that Alcohol is more dangerous than marijuana. Than yeah, I actually believe I actually I actually believe that alcohol should be uh, banned again, and they just legalize pot. I'm like, it, it'll make everything safer. <laughs> it's definitely, you know, I don't know a lot of people getting stoned on weed and going out and vandalizing stuff with a bunch of buddies and doing gang rapes together. Funny story when I was growing up. Was, yeah, funny story when I was growing up. I was the only person in my entire household who could pass a drug test. My brother and my parents could not. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do anything like that growing up as a kid. I was. I was more straight edge. And I didn't drink. And I didn't. I don't drink. I don't smoke or whatnot. I didn't do that either. My brother did, uh, as well as that's as far as he's willing to go because, well, he's seen worse things happen. And my half sister, which I'm not going to say her name on the air, but. For those of you who watch me or uh, see me on Lorcat Live, uh, was arrested last year, and or I believe it was in May or April, when she was fleeing from the raw law, and she was a, and right now she's a recovering heroin addict, and she just recently got released from prison, uh, I think on the 18th of December, and she herself said, "I'm thankful that they act. I'm actually glad that they arrested me when they did, because I was able to get clean." And I honestly didn't see, and she didn't see herself living throughout the rest of the week. Because apparently she was fleeing the police for like two weeks, and they found her at like 2 a.m. in the mo, or in a motel room, all boarded up. And I still remember the mugshot that they posted, and she looked like she was almost dead. And she looks wow. way better now, because she actually got the treatment that she needed when she was in prison, as well as she That's turned her life around, too. To what? It's, it's- thing to come back from, you know, and that's where treatment works better than just straight up incarceration. Yeah, she actually got treated, and she refuses to go back to that point because she, or I'm like, she doesn't like the way it, it what it did to her body, and now she's willing to, yeah. or I'm like, and I, that actually Look, makes me, ha- that drink, actually, I don't drink the, the meth drinks, I don't drink the monster energy drinks, that's stuff I don't, like that. yeah, I don't I, drink I, that I, either. I'm friends with uh, Kevin Eastman. Creator of uh, co-creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Kevin told me about his '90s when him and Bidley their drink was vodka and Red Bull. And frankly, the Red Bull, and this is a man with money to afford a dentist, the Red Bull rotted out his teeth. He was dissolving his teeth, and that's something that they're not letting people know about these energy drinks. I mean, if you're 16 years old and you need an energy drink, what the hell's wrong with you, dude? 16, you should have all the energy in the world. It's 
should be some old man that eats that thing. I don't even drink energy drinks. Because I don't like I what don't they do to my body. I try to stay away from them. The only time I, I ever find myself drinking them is when I'm on a long movie shoot. That's the only time i found myself drinking those things. I just Otherwise, stick with regular coffee. I'll take a Jack and Coke. <laughs> I'll take a Jack and Coke, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'd stick with, I just stick with regular coffee because that's more than enough caffeine I need. Because I made the mistake, like, uh, I think it was like three or four years ago, I got four energy drinks, and it was finals week, and I had one a day, so I could actually make sure I could, I would be energetic enough to take the final exams. Near the end of the week, my heart was pounding, and I'm like, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> so, I haven't bothered drinking, and if I do have one, I make sure I wait at least a week before I even attempt to drink another one. <laughs> Well, I guess we're rambling. Which yeah. We should get back to the interview. Are there any more questions for me? Or? Uh, no, that was actually the, the anything else I should know was the last question of the thing. Well, I guess something that I should say is one of the things that's different with my business is I've seen in the film business there's been no transparency. So with my artists and my creators, I try to be very straightforward and, and honest with them and straightforward with them and just try to tell people the way it is and try to deal with Hollywood in a different fashion. You know, Hollywood is known for crazy accounting and for crazy ways to screw people out of their cut. And that's that's not what I'm about. I'm a very south side of Chicago guy where everybody should get their piece of the pie. And so we view our customers as, you know, somebody that we want to make happy. We don't see them as somebody to fleece. We see them as somebody to make happy so they'll come back and give us more money. So when we tell people, hey, the way to support us is by buying an American Horrors t-shirt, that's how you're going to support us instead of us coming up with some scam or some scheme or some way to hit you with an extra fee or an extra service fee or a ticket handling fee. You know what I'm saying? We really want to provide value for what you're paying for. I actually want to buy one of those uh, AR-15 asshole remover t-shirts because I saw that on your site and like, I must have this. <laughs> You should get them, man. You should get them. I don't know how much longer Danny's going to be making those things. Because that's not even my design. I actually, I wore that. I wore that when I had a meeting with uh, Don Cameron, James Cameron's little brother. And he was for, for Safe Sig when I was doing the celebrity spokesman stuff for Safe Sig. And uh, I went into my meeting wearing the AK 47 or AR 15 and over Boomer shirt. And uh, I didn't realize John had been a Marine. So he loved my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I have to get one of those while they're still in stock. I'll I'll, I'll somehow front the I'll somehow front the twenty bucks. I have to have one <laughs> just so I can wear it at the college and just and just watch everyone's reactions. So uh, where people will flip, they will flip. Especially now, I I keep forgetting about how namby pamby, artsy fartsy. You really need to hang out with my group then, because one of my or this the the uh, the group that I usually sit around with, which I was actually sitting around with today, we're in a circle and we uh, we just basically say what's on our minds, and it's got to the point where we don't care what everyone else thinks. My friend Welshy, in particular, he will insult you and laugh about it, and you can't really get mad at him because it's hilarious. Because <laughs> the way he does it. <laughs> so we're uh, so we're gonna have to wrap this up. So where can people find you? Well, the best place to find American Horrors is at FilmOn.com, kind of like Flame On from the Human Torch. <laughs> Only Film On it's F I L M O N dot com or dot TV. Either one will get you there. And then American Horrors is in the horror section, so our channel's in the horror section. If you want to find me online, I'm on Twitter. I don't tweet like like mad like everybody else, but I, I Twitter out some stuff. I'm on there, Hart underscore Fisher, and that's H-A-R-T, and my last name is H-E-R. And if you want to find me online, yeah, I'm on Facebook, and also American Horrors is on Facebook, too. And if you guys know any horror people or horror creators that have a short horror film, have a horror theme music video we want to check it out we want to see it we're looking for content to put on the air and you can find me on twitter at superstrider86 you can also check out my deviant art where i do perler beat pixel art which is one of my side projects which i just 
it's just something I do for commission for people, and it tends to be quite popular among nerds, at least. And you can also find me uh, on lorecat.com, which I'm one of the guys who posts there. And uh, I have to, th- I have to thank you, Hart, for taking the time out to do this because, wow, we've been talking for like I'm just looking back on the recording. We're going. It's already wrote reached the 51 minute mark. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, you know, you got to get the word out there. you got to get the word out there. Yeah. So, uh, I still need to get the... I'm going to have to upload this tomorrow, or at least the MP3. I need to get a picture of American Horrors, because I'm just going to put that as the static image screen while you just listen to us talk about this. So... Well, we've got a whole boatload of Facebook banner covers loaded up on the AmericanHorrors.com Facebook page. So just go to the American Horrors uh, Facebook page, you know, Facebook.com backslash American Horrors. And just download a bunch of the Facebook banner covers and stuff we posted up there, movie posters and things. Yeah, I'll just start posting those as the uh, background images, so it's just not one static screen. So I like the I had I thank you again for taking the time out to do this. I know you're a busy man considering all the work that you have to do at American Horrors, and I recommend oh, yeah, my I'm in post right now on all these new shows. <laughs> yeah. And I recommend my reviewers or the what little amount I have, and hopefully I get more people to come. To you have to listen to Heart Attack. I can't stress this enough. There's so much going on, and that you just can't find, or that just the news does not tell you because, well, most corporations own the news nowadays. Oh yeah, dude. On today's Heart Attack, we talked on and on about how Obama's administration, the officials that they have tapped, are all receiving multi-million-dollar bonuses from Citigroup and Bank of America. And these are the guys in charge of negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. Which is basically, for those of you who don't know, is the new spin on what was originally SOPA, but they're trying to push it through without telling anybody about it. So they can oh, it's con- even worse, because what this would be, this treaty would be, it'd be a treaty that would not have to be ratified by our Constitution. So it could be constitutionally illegal, but they could still make it into law. Which is actually pretty scary, and to be Very honest... scary, and you've got multi-million dollar bonuses from Citigroup and Bank of America when we just had eight bankers die suspiciously in the last month. But that's enough of that, I gotta go, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for doing this, alright. Uh, just, if you want to do something else again, just message me on Facebook if you want. <laughs> or I'll message right, you or whatever. Thanks, okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. And this is super... Oh, I just... Yeah, this is Super Strider signing off. I hope you enjoyed this. Bye.